Defense mechanisms have two sets of key characteristics that have important consequences. The first is the distinction between constitutive and inducible, and the second is the distinction between innate and acquired. Whether a defense mechanism is constitutive or inducible depends on its costs, its deployment requirements, and whether the hostile environmental factors are present always, occasionally, or only periodically. Most defenses are inducible on demand because they cost a lot and they are unnecessary or even detrimental in the absence of the threat. They fully satisfy the functional criterion for recognizing adaptations that we discussed in the first lectures. The cost of much of the immune system, energy, immunopathology, collateral tissue damage, are too high to allow constitutive activation in the absence of infection. This is something that you only want to turn on when you need it. Its low-cost components, the secreted defensins and things like immunoglobulin A, are constitutive because they do not damage dim tissue and they don't cost very much, so they can be on all the time. There are some issues with inducing a defense. When several defense mechanisms can protect from a given challenge, they should be induced in the order of increasing cost. For example, avoidance is cheaper than repair. And anticipatory responses can be induced for challenges that occur with predictable periodicity, for example, the seasons, or upon detecting a proxy that signals immediate presence. For example, starvation in the womb and in neonates alters metabolism for years, protecting the developing brain, but creating risks for late life diabetes, obesity, and cardiovascular disease. We saw that with DOHAD, the Developmental Origins of Health and Disease. This is an anticipatory response. There are some other features of induction, hormesis and acclimatization. Innate defenses can be adjusted to the environment by individual experience. A secondary exposure to the same noxious factor results then in a more efficient and a more rapid response. This process is called hormesis. So, for example, exposure to a low level of a toxin can induce expression of detoxification genes so that subsequent exposure to otherwise lethal doses can be tolerated. This is something that every culture that has used poisons to kill people has known about. It's one of the ways to defend oneself against poisoning. And it figures prominently in the case of Valentin de Villefort and the Count of Monte Cristo. Hormesis is related to acclimatization, but the two op usually operate on different timescales. The term hormesis is usually applied to a discrete environmental exposure, for example, a dose of toxin, while acclimatization is usually applied to continuous exposures, for example, changes in temperature, humidity, oxygen tension, things like that. So here is a figure of Dumont uh, talking to Valentine. He gave her small dose, anticipating that she would be the object of a poisoning attempt, he gave her small doses of the poison, and when she was actually poisoned in the novel, she went into a coma and recovered. So that's an example of hormesis. Now, what about the reversibility of defenses and the time scales on which that can be done? Most inducible mechanisms are reversible, and they do operate on different time scales. Rapid physiological adaptation operates on the scale of seconds to minutes, so that would be hyperventilation, shivering, increased heart rate, all methods of dealing with temperature change. Lipolysis, gluconeogenesis, and the immune response operate on the scale of hours to days. Acclimatization operates on the scale of days to weeks, months, and years. It can take quite a while to get used to walking at high altitude. 
And developmental plasticity is an often irreversible form of adaptation that is usually induced at an early developmental stage and then it lasts for a lifetime. So we have seen this diagram before and it lays out the idea that physiological adaptation is fast, acclimation is intermediate, developmental plasticity is slow and often irreversible. There are important distinctions between immune and behavioral defenses. Defenses that are mediated by the immune and the nervous system have two distinct components, innate and acquired. So this is actually a similarity. Both of them, in some sense, learn. Acquired and learned defenses are very flexible, and they can be adjusted to unpredictable environments. So if you don't know what kind of environment is going to be encountered, it would be good to have a system designed that can learn to deal with anything that comes along. And the kinds of things that are unpredictable are pathogens, predators, toxic plants, venomous insects. We need methods of dealing with all of those things. Adaptive and acquired systems also have the benefit of memory. We have both neurological memory and we have immune memory. The immune system thus resembles the nervous system in some important ways. We also know that the two systems can communicate with each other to share information on the environment. There is crosstalk between the immune system and the central nervous system. Fle this kind of flexibility has benefits, but it also has costs. Although most invertebrates rely for defense on innate immunity and behavior, whereas vertebrates use both innate and adaptive acquired immunity and behavior, why adaptive systems evolved in vertebrates is not completely clear, for they are impressively risky. Although the adaptive systems of vertebrates provide clear advantages, they also create vulnerabilities to disease that are absent in invertebrates these vulnerabilities include autoimmune and allergic diseases, mental diseases, and behavioral abnormalities such as severe obsessive compulsive disorder, paranoia, and phobia. The costs of flexibility thus include risks of new types of disease. The point being made here is that one does not often see a mentally deranged honeybee or a mentally deranged octopus, those kinds of vulnerabilities are consequences of the flexibility and complexity of our adaptive behavioral system, and they resemble the vulnerabilities that we have in our adaptive immune system. So here is a guy with paranoia, and here are some lesions in the central nervous system. So benefits and costs of homeostasis. Homeostasis is overall a good thing. It keeps the internal environment constant, but the mechanisms that produce it contain vulnerabilities. The idea of la constance du milieu intérieur comes from Claude Bernard, the great 19th century French physiologist. And he saw that internal regulation was important. It is done with systems that have multiple set points. So they are rheostatic. They can be set to different levels of concentration, different levels of temperature, and that is one of the ways that they are flexible. But those are also set points that can be broken. So that is how we evolve to optimize our adaptation to varying needs and environments. A single set point system is resistant to dysregulation but, and does not lead to a disease of homeostasis. But if you have multiple set points, as for example with our blood sugar levels, they are vulnerable to dysregulation and they permit then the diseases of homeostasis. The same mechanisms that evolve to change the set points with adaptive consequences thus permit dysregulation and disease. Such diseases include type 2 diabetes, gout, 
and some types of obesity, here illustrated for gout and obesity. Some of the features of these systems are redundancy, compensation, and compatibility, and it's worth taking a minute or two to distinguish among them. Most defenses have multiple components whose deployment is coordinated and it unfolds in order of increasing cost. The components can compensate for each other when one is damaged, and that makes the system robust and efficient. However, the intact components also have to operate at higher magnitude or for longer duration, and that can result in immunopathology. So if one part of the system is knocked out and another compensates, it can overcompensate. Compatible defenses are ones that neither cooperate nor interfere. Synergistic defenses are defenses that cooperate and incompatible defenses interfere with each other. So for example, inflammation is incompatible with detoxification and cold adaptation and an immune defense are both incompatible with a starvation response. So in thinking about defenses, it's wise to keep in mind these issues of redundancy, compensation, and compatibility because they are all involved in the diseases of defense. So to summarize, defenses are inducible when they are costly. Redundant defenses are induced in order of increasing cost. Hormesis occurs when a first exposure to a threat induces defenses that make later exposures less harmful and more rapidly dealt with. Induction of defenses takes time. It can take from seconds to months, depending upon the factor and the type of defense. Adaptive and acquired defenses have the benefits of flexibility and memory, but those also make us vulnerable to new types of diseases.